from all of us um, to you, Kala, a deep and gracious, warm welcome. We really appreciate you giving up some time to spend with us this evening. I think we're very privileged to have such an authoritative individual spend time with us. Um, whilst we have sent out a brief overview and, and bio of, of Kala, um, I can share with you that um, Kala is a senior partner, founder, and, and, and head at um, Raja and um, Raja, Raja and Tan, who's probably one of the largest, if not leading, legal law firms in, in Singapore. Um, Carla herself is um, an authoritative individual on competition and antitrust and trade law um, and consults widely both within Singapore and beyond the borders of Singapore. So honestly, what we have is we have a subject matter expert in the room tonight, and we're deeply grateful, Carla, for, for your time and um, very pleased that you'd be prepared to speak to us. I know that Rotary is quite close to you. Um, apparently, you share a home with somebody that's deeply committed to, to Rotary um, in um, uh, fellow Rotary and uh, Vijay Pawani, um, who I haven't actually met personally, but um, we really appreciate the time. So to get the fireside chat started, um, I arrived in Asia eight years ago, and um, boy, have I learned a lot of lessons. You know, we've taken our business from one country to 11 and Maybe I wish I'd met somebody like you, Kala, a whole, whole many years before, because I think I might still have had some of my hair. Um, but it's just, it's been interesting for us, you know, as we've set up, just to try and understand, we wanted to expand our business beyond the borders of Singapore. And it was, you know, Asia Pacific was, was certainly fertile grow, grounds and will continue to probably trade well ahead of many other markets or regions for, for years to come. But it's complicated. Um, in trying to set up in, in, in a foreign location, I'm understanding requirements, and in some areas, actually having to select a partner because for, for many reasons, you, you can't trade um, or operate on your own. How does an organization go about starting to think about this and make sure that they always aligned and staying on the right side of law. Sean, thanks for that. Um, a lot of questions there. Now, before I get into that, I want to say thank you very much for having me um, on today. Um, I, I do apologize for, for coming back to you slightly late. Uh, it's just a question of timing and, and years and so too many things going on at the same time. Um, now, on this topic itself, You've been very kind in saying I'm an expert, but the reality is if you just run down the list of names of the people who are attending this session, you will realize that the expertise lies in the Zoom room um, of varying expertise, just given the varying nature of the businesses involved as well. And I'm just one speck in that, in that whole sort of um, expertise in the room. And... So please, by, by no means take what I say as being definitive or, or the authority as such, because it's just one view and um, it really comes down to, to the nature of your business, what it is that you want to try and achieve, where do you plan to go into, um, how big do you want to be, uh, uh, as being some of the key factors that you need to look at. Um, as you decide whether you want to venture out. Now, I pause there to say a very good evening to everybody, which I missed. Um, um, and, and I know it's coming to the end of the week, so I hope everyone's in really good spirits. Now, to take your questions in turn, um, when you talk about governance generally as a, as a big topic, Governance um, can be defined very narrowly and looked at as a set of rules, um, making sure that you have the right people within your, your organization, um, handling various issues and ensuring compliance with the law. That's one element of governance as such. And if you're a listed company, then it's looking at issues such as the code of corporate governance and whether you've complied with it. 
But that's really a very tiny part of governance. And when you're going abroad and intending to sort of set up elsewhere, um, the structures that you put in place in your home country is going to be important. That lays the foundation as to how the rest of your businesses in the regional countries um, operate. Now, uh, taking the next step there, it's looking at due diligence. And this is not typical lawyer speak. When I say due diligence, um, if you're going to go into uh, any country at all, even if you're coming into Singapore, doing the right due diligence is important. And as you do due, due diligence, I guess some of the critical answer, questions that you have to ask, as I alluded to just now, what is your business and why do you want to enter into that particular country? Are you manufacturing? Are you services? In services, are you an FI, a financial institution? Are you a professional um, uh, service provider? Are you a consultant? Or are you more sort of hands-on, for instance? Each one of these businesses will call for a different set of factors that you're looking at as you decide to enter into a country. The next thing is when you do enter into a country, um, you need to be looking at structures. Can you just go in and set up and, and start running your business? What FDI requirements do you have to comply with? So when I talk about FDI, it's really foreign investment rules. Um, do you need a local partner? Does the local partner need to have majority holdings? And if he does need to have majority holdings, then the question of how you manage um, your structure becomes even more important because you, you're sort of signing away your business when someone else is taking majority holdings, right? And we might say we put the best contracts in place, but at the end of the day, if there's a dispute that comes up, the best contracts may not necessarily help you. So how do you manage it? Um, right smack, uh, currently we, we have an issue of a, a, a client who has businesses globally with a presence in this part of the world with a partner, a distributor in Thailand. Um, but the distributor, because of COVID, has faced various problems and essentially holding on to various products, but not being able to sell them, not paying my client. Um, and, and, you know, it, it gets into a, a stalemate of sorts. What do you do there? And it's not as easy as I'm going to terminate the contract. How do I get my money back? So I, I, I give you that as an illustration because it comes back to the local partner identifying uh, the right kind of local partner because the best contracts, which are important, may not always assist you. The next category of um, factors you need to look at is regulations. What are the local law requirements other than FDI requirements? What other local law requirements do you need to comply with? Um, and this goes into licensing permits, um, a whole range of different issues, disclosure requirements annually and so on. Now here may not directly be relevant to many people, but um, one of the areas that I work in is trade, trade laws. And in trade laws, it essentially means movement of goods and services, right? And in movement of goods, um, when you export certain types of goods out of Singapore, you do need a special permit. It's a strategic goods permit. It's, it's for goods which have dual use, which can be used essentially for commercial purposes as well as military goods. The laws in the US, for example, just using one illustration, is not identical. And yet, many go with the view that the US is best of class if it complies with US laws, it means it's complied with inter alia Singapore laws. I've had many instances when goods come in from the US and then moving out of Singapore, either because of transshipment or because they go through some transformation in Singapore and they're going to be exported. And the permits are not, the right permits are not obtained. And the violations can be very severe. I mean, we're lucky in Singapore, we're pro-business, but this is not the case in every country. So, so knowing the rules, the regulations is going to be very important. And there are a whole host of other elements as well. Let me touch on one, just one more aspect and then I'll, I'll pause. Um, issues of repatriation. Whether you're looking at funds, you put funds in there. How do you get your funds back? 
how how do you ensure that the country you've gone into is not going to suddenly become sanctioned? Just look at what's been happening with China, US, for instance. Um, and so how do you get monies back from the businesses that you run? Um, apart from flow of funds, it's also the individuals. They could suddenly become um, persona non grata and face complex issues within the countries that they're operating within. So you've sent employees over, but how do you get them out? Now, I've talked about a lot of different concepts covering small businesses all the way to the very large ones. And the issues is really scratching surface. I'm, I'm going to pause there and pass it back to Sean. Well, so it's complicated. I mean, I guess if I had to summarize, really, what you're saying is that be clear on your reason and your purpose for going offshore or, or, or entry, um, structuring matters. Um, and I feel like I might be punting the legal fraternity now, but it's probably safe to sit with your advisors and make sure that your structures are sound before one, before one goes offshore. Due diligence, hugely important, both in terms of requirements of market, but equally partnerships. Um, and I do find that to be a bit of a challenge. You know, you enter a market, you, I'm not saying that one is naive, but it's hard to, to kind of figure out is this organization, is the individual of good standing? You know, no one knows what the future holds and how things could change. Um, regulations and permits in itself is a myriad of complexity. Um, and then I think this whole notion, which is important, of the ability to repatriate retained um, earnings. So I think you've given us a really good start of key considerations when one does decide, or if an organization decides that they, they wish to go offshore. Off, off, off What's really been a challenge for ourselves, because in some of the markets we operate, we do operate with, with partners. And cultural alignment is something that has really been important. And maybe this speaks a little bit to that due diligence that you that you spoke about. Any advice or watch outs or holes of wisdom you think we should consider? Culture is a huge word, and it's a word, unfortunately, that is bandied around um, in, in various aspects. We talk about governance culture. We talk about um, uh, another sort of pet area of mine is, is workplace safety and health. So we talk about safety culture and, and so on and so forth, a compliance culture. Culture is a huge word. When you're going into another country um, to set up shop, be it... Um, um, like I said, a, a professional business, so it could be medical business, a uh, consultancy, or goods and goods as such, manufacturing, um, and so on. Um, one important element that I have picked up in, in my career is always try and work with the culture of the local country. Now, many um, MNCs tend to come into jurisdictions and um, impose their culture. There, 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 there's a little good in that um, to the extent that best practices are adopted, good governance approaches are adopted, but that's about where it should end because every country has a certain culture within which they operate. And if you can meld within that culture, I think the ability to grow bigger, quicker is, is going to be there. Um, now, that's in relation to understanding the culture of the land. Now, another key element about culture is, um, and, and I just have to talk about this, is, is ABCs, right? Um, which is basically anti-bribery and corruption concerns. Now, if I say you, you sort of meld with the culture of the land, and if it's common in that culture to sort of pay bribery, is that something that you end up doing? The answer cannot be yes. Regardless of whether you're a large MNC or a small SME out of Singapore going into another country, I think corruption and bribery should never ever come into the picture. Um, corruption and bribery could be called facilitation payment. The US allows for facilitation payments, but take note, Singapore does not allow for facilitation payments. 
that's that's a unique culture element there that that needs to be worked through, um, and and it comes up every so often. Now, I, I had a recent case of um, a client facing an issue in a country, Southeast Asian country, will not name it, and the advice that the client had received from someone was, "Why don't you consider?" Um, doing a, a donation to someone and then you might get what you needed done. Um, the client flipped simply because, you know, you, you call it a donation, but that's almost as if it's a bribery. Um, and to the client, it's like we're an MNC. How can that advice even come to us, for instance? Um, that's, that's the sort of gold standard that you want to, to go with. Yes, they may be an MNC and we might be SMEs here, but it is nevertheless an important standard. So as I talk about culture, trying to meld with local culture so that you can grow is important, but knowing how to pick the right and, and, and not falling into um, gaps and, and going with some of the negatives um, is, is a balance to be sought as well. So I'm not sure, Sean, if I'm answering the question that, that you're posing, um, but I thought it was important to highlight that we do need to be alert to, to, to bribery concerns. And one last point on the bribery concern, I mentioned the US allows for facilitation payments, but Singapore, for example, does not. Singapore's laws on bribery and corruption are extraterritorial. So if you are a company incorporated in Singapore, or you are a Singapore citizen and you go abroad and you offer a bribe, no matter how small um, or how disguised, you can be prosecuted in Singapore. And that similar laws have now been extended into Malaysia as well. And in fact, Malaysia's laws are very strict um, because it also, it also has, um, I, I forget the exact provision right now, but I do know that it's a lot stricter. Um, if you look at the UK, UK's bribery laws are also very strict and so on and so forth. So hence, I picked that one up and highlighted as a concern. Look, I thought that was a very rich answer, so thank you. Um, I love the way you started off by saying that uh, culture is a huge word. Um, and I think people often think about the way we greet each other, the way we treat each other. But there is this notion of organizational culture, particularly when it comes to compliance. Um, I think that, you know, global organizations or MNCs definitely have ways of working. And if I could use a bit of colloquialism, maybe it's this globalization. So you take a, glo a global or, or MNC approach, but it, it needs to be localized. I think the final take out I take from this is that you, culturally you need to make sure you stay on the right side of law. It does, however, pose a question. So how does a MNC or an organization that has decided to go offshore, try to be and remain, try to be and remain compliant, yet be competitive in market. Because it could feel as though there are different rules for different parties when they play within a market. Um, so that, that was a, that's an interesting question. Uh, to remain commercially viable and, and competitive um, does it, in a sense, contradict the, the, the need to ensure total compliance? Personally, I don't see it as such. And I guess I'm coming from the, the angle of a lawyer, a regulatory lawyer at that. And I look at compliance issues from all different angles. Um, of course, now with a focus on, on competition and trade issues, um, I do not see them as, as two sides of the coin. In fact, I see having a good compliance system, ensuring that you can remain competitive, you can maintain your commercial viability. How, how do I mean um, by that? A, if you have poor compliance, the likelihoods of um, bribery occurring could be high. The likelihoods of non-compliance with certain disclosure rules or getting permits, for example, um, could be there. There is a cost for all of that. If you do not get the right permits, for example, you may be um, hampered in your exports. So that's going to be a cost that you need to deal with, 
of course that you need to rect um, uh, the rectification process is another cost. The opportunity cost of management as well as they have to deal with all of that. Those are costs sometimes that we completely forget about, but they are important. And I think those are costs when you balance against trying to maintain a compliant environment um, overall, it keeps you competitive. Now, as I say that as well, you also need to see what your market is. You have entered into the country. Is your market global? Is your market local? And that goes to the size of your market as well. Um, because if, you, if you're looking to be really, in a sense, regional, um, global, then compliance, I think it's going to be very important because it goes to your reputation. It goes to ensuring that you're keeping your, your customers as well. Um, one wrong move and potentially you run the risk of losing your customers as well. So that's, that's an, um, another aspect to, to, to sort of think about. And as I'm talking about that, I mean, there's some really good questions that have come in. If I may, I just wanted to pick up on one that talked about um, ABC as well. And this is a very real point. So you as the, the, the company are complying and you do everything right. But you might have a middleman who's assisting you with um, various processes. And that middleman is the one that, um, say, engages in the corrupt practices. Does that come back to bite you? It could. If you know about it and you've not done anything, if you know that that is in fact the practice and you continue to deal with that facilitator as such, it could potentially be sufficient evidence to say that you have yourself violated the laws. Now, Singapore's legislation is wide enough um, to capture that kind of scenario. And we've had huge cases um, across the world involving local companies as well. So the point there is it can come back to bite you years later. So you really have to be alert to that. Um, there are many other very good questions, but I'm just going to pause there and pass it back to you, Sean, as I, as I read some of these questions. Well, I guess just summarizing what you've spoken about. So firstly, I think compliance actually is a great value proposition. So when we go to market and we, and, and we talk about competition, to be compliant or com to have levels of compliance in your business, good levels of compliance, I think is part of the value proposition. I think this final point that you've spoken about, um, you are complicit if a third party is acting on your behalf, does anything untoward and you are found out, become, you, know, you, you become complicit. Um, I, know, <laughs> I think we're going to run out of time. I do think that there's one or two other questions that maybe, kind of, if you wouldn't mind putting your attention to and um, giving us um, your view on it, um, we would greatly appreciate that. Sure, ha happy to. Um, just picking up, Sean, on your last point about um, third parties acting on your behalf, for example. Um, and, and that's also, in a sense, picking up another question that came in. I think it's from Nirmal. Um, in relation to, it's common to hire a middleman to manage affairs for you. Up to there, yes, brilliant. It's common to have middlemen um, help clear customs. It's common to have middlemen deal with a distribution network in some of the larger Asian countries, for example, not, not leaving Asia and going into, say, South America and all of that. And yet, as you choose those partners, you need to do the, your due diligence to see whether they are, in a sense, paying facilitation monies or are they um, effectively, are they carrying on their business in an effective manner where down the line they do need the help of additional individuals as well. And I know it's a fine line to tread but it is possible to sort of, um, on the one hand, tread on the clean um, and, and be very clear as to what each individual down the line is doing. And on the other hand, to simply just pay funds and facilitate um, um, uh, speeding up certain decision-making process or movement of goods and so on and so forth. It's a fine line, but it can be done. Um, I, I don't want to sit here on a, on a pedestal as such and sort of, um, uh, suggest that it's, it's an easy game to play. It's not. It's very difficult. There's a lot of considerations that come up. 
a lot many of the companies that I deal with um, do take this very seriously. Training becomes very important, not just for their own employees, but also for the contractors that they work with, the distributors that they work with, and they try and pass it down the line. And now as you look at sustainability becoming a big deal um, and your, your sort of um, populace as the younger populace comes into business as well, they focus a lot on sustainability. And here it's not just about the environment, but it is doing your business in a clean um, manner as well. So the governance aspects of that is also important. So you're looking at the whole ESG. Um, environmental social governance coming into play. So increasingly, I think that um, um, if you do not sort of um, walk the, the straight path, it's going to be harder and harder to do business as such. Um, another quick question, if I move on, how do I rate the compliance comparisons in the ASEAN countries? It varies. It varies quite considerably. Having said that, I think in recent years, at least in the last half a decade or so, there's been a huge move to level up. So many of the, the, the sort of um, less developed ASEAN countries have been leveling up. And one critical thing I want to highlight is ASEAN, the ASEAN Secretariat has been taking a lot of positive steps in putting in place, um, encouraging countries to put in place relevant laws uh, be it in relation to consumer protection, be it in relation to data protection, managing corruption issues, and, and so on and so forth. Now, ASEAN itself obviously cannot enforce because it's a voluntary body. But by putting together MOUs, um, they do get the 10 countries to sign on. Uh, not everyone reaches that level, but um, I'm currently working on a project for ASEAN and as I see the different countries coming back with responses and so on as well, you can tell that it's very different to say a decade ago, everyone wants to level up. And to a large extent, it's also the, the movement of the e-commerce world, which has, I think, um, provided a new opening to many businesses to reach out to a larger audience, a larger customer base. Um, and which means that unless you get your governance levels up, uh, you get your business practices up in, a, in an appropriate manner, you, you're going to be losing up. And I think the countries recognize that. So we've come a long way from, say, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of other questions. Um, antitrust uh, accepted. Sorry, I have to end. No, no, I'm, I was just going to say that please take those questions, I think. Uh, you know, it's important to address. It's a very interesting topic and it's very, very relevant to many of our participants here. So please take a couple of, whatever, two, three more minutes and address. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sonali. Um, okay, I'm just going to go on with the, the next question there. So it asks about whether ASEAN has the same regime generally as um, um, the EU as far as antitrust laws are concerned. Antitrust is actually a US term. The Europeans call it competition law, which is what many of the countries in ASEAN call it as well. The essence of the principles are very similar and articles 85, 86 are now 101 and 102 in the EU. So, so they've been updated as well. Um, all 10 countries finally now have competition laws. Cambodia just passed their law finally after like 17 years um, two weeks ago or thereabouts. It's, it's, the implementing regulations are not out yet, but I expect them out um, in the course of early next year. Um, general principles, very similar across all 10 countries. Uh, a lot of depth to go into if I'm going to even talk about competition laws. Um, so I'll just answer that as is and move on. Um, which country law is applicable in a multi-party agreement? Too wide a question. It depends on what your contract is all about. Um, typically, when you enter into a contract, multi-party, dual party, doesn't matter, parties will decide which is the applicable law. So there's a choice of law provision that you typically go with. It could be Singapore. Obviously, as a Singapore-based lawyer, I try and push Singapore law. Um, if there's an English company involved or a US company involved, 
um, or European company, they, they tend to one English law or Swiss law or New York law. Um, nevertheless, excuse me, nevertheless, increasingly we try and push for Singapore and doing a pitch here for Singapore because um, Singapore tends to be a bit more neutral, but more importantly, other than a very well-established arbitration network, we also have this thing called a Singapore International Commercial Court. It's an international commercial court. The judges are not Singapore-based. We have 18 judges drawn from 18 different countries. Um, Cross-border contract cases can be argued in that particular jurisdiction. How do you enforce it subsequent to the decision being issued? Parties have to agree that they will respect the decision that is issued and enforce it. So there are many good reasons as to why you want to choose Singapore law. Assuming you haven't put your choice of law in, then there are a whole range of conflicts principles that um, will guide you on what is the right law to apply. It could be place of performance, it could be place of where you're located and so on. Again, a very deep topic, not possible to go through all of it um, today. Um, uh, OFAC sanctions. Okay, maybe I take sanctions and then and then I, I pause. Um, sanctions is a big thing. Now I know OFAC has been has been highlighted there, but sanctions um, are basically uh, uh, restrictions placed, uh, it's, it's more political. So restrictions placed by one government on another country or another or a business located in a, in a country to try and make doing business with them very difficult for various reasons, either because they're associated with terrorism and so on. So the US has OFAC, um, the EU has its own set of sanctions, Singapore has its own set of sanctions. Singapore sanctions tend to mirror OECD. Um, but sanctions laws are very complex as well. And the biggest sort of um, fights come up because the US sanctions can be very wide. Not the entire world doesn't necessarily recognize US sanctions. So US may overnight have a sanction imposed against Ukraine or Russia, for example. Um, and if I'm dealing with Russia and if I and my transactions got nothing to do with the US, but I'm collecting payment in US dollar, if uh, uh, the sanctions could hit me, a company here in Singapore, because my, my currency transaction is US dollars and US dollars always get cleared to the US, which means that I may not get paid for my transaction, putting it at a very simple level. Sanctions is an area I do quite a bit of work in, very interesting. The antithesis of sanctions is now blocking statutes. So increasingly, you see countries introducing blocking statutes, meaning that, say, say country A has a sanction, country B will introduce laws to say, I block those sanctions so I can continue to do business in any event with those alleged sanctions country. Um, it's a political fight to some extent. It's um, there have been a number of cases coming out of the EU and and the UK, particularly in relation to OFAC type sanctions vis-a-vis -vis EU blocking rights. Um, increasingly, we're starting to see that in our part of the world. The most recent blocking statutes coming out of our part of the world is China issuing a blocking statute vis-a-vis -vis the US, um, which had imposed sanctions on them earlier this year. Um, and, and it just makes for interesting um, supply chain issues. How do I get my goods moving? How do I try and see if I can change rules of origin so that I don't get blocked by sanctions? But currency is also important. And I realize I can go on and on and on. I'm going to pause and just end off by saying that when we talk about governance issues, governance is huge. Governance ties into compliance, compliance in relation to regulations, and there are a whole range of different regulations um, that require compliance. And as you move out of one country into other countries, you need to focus on your home country rules and regulations, but you also need to focus on the rules and regulations of the countries that you're going into. Otherwise, you run into difficulties of repatriation of funds, for instance, 
movement of your goods, movement of your people even, the, the problems do come up. ABC, as we discussed it, is a big issue, but it's, it's an issue that's always been there. It needs to be managed. Um, and finally, we didn't talk much about this, but employment issues, employment-related concerns. I think the last two years almost um, have brought to fore many employment-centric issues as well because of COVID. Uh, another very interesting areas, area which keeps us very busy. Let me pause there and hand it back to Sean. I hope this has been helpful. Um, thank you. Well, I can't really speak on behalf of my fellow Rotarians and the honorary guests we have, but it certainly has been helpful to me. I realize how little I know. Um, I hope we haven't made any footfalls along our journey of, of, of expansion um, and just speaks to why dealing with professionals to support you is so, so important. Um, Kyla, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for giving up your time, for sharing what I think is, I think you are the subject matter expert or subjects that you've spoken about. And we're just very, very grateful to, to you. What I'm going to do is hand over to past President Lipke um, to um, give a vote of thanks. Uh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can yes. Thank you, Kala, for what I would say a very interesting and uh, to me a mind blowing experience because uh, I came into this lecture, well, this the talk, quite clear that this does not, not apply to us. It does not apply to Rotary when we do our work. It does not apply to medicine when I go uh, for joint ventures overseas. But uh, having heard you through, I see that, realize that no, well, we have actually a lot more that we need to cover. And uh, some of the unanswered questions to me are very much like uh, recently, uh, the Zoom, the use of Zoom, has it, uh, does it actually enhance or does it make it more difficult for you, uh, you no, know, for your governance. And in terms of uh, Rotary, I think we have been getting on very well uh, going through Rotary Foundation for most of ours and having local partners who actually carry out all the work and uh, everything is, the chain is very well established. But I'm sure that uh, there are quite a lot of things that uh, we need you to touch on. Maybe we'll have to get uh, Pavani uh, to really go through some of those aspects with you and uh, I hope and look forward to uh, another talk. Thank you very much for the uh, most enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, your kind words and thanks very much everybody for being such a wonderful audience. Um, Thank you again and have a great meeting ahead. Thank you, Kala. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the questions are still coming in. <laughs> we don't want it to end at all. And uh, yeah, we can clearly see the passion that you have, your understanding. You can clearly see that. And we hope we can bring you back. And <laughs> maybe, maybe when we can do a physical meeting where people can, you know, stand around you and ask you a ton of questions. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's really, really thankful uh, for your time today. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>